two siblings. So what I use sometimes is this to try to create the image of trying to determine what's a new species is not all that easy. It just doesn't happen. We don't give birth to a new species. We give birth to slight variation over time. So what color is that bar? Green. Green? Okay, yeah, a couple, probably a couple blind people. Um, so I want you to tell me when, when it turns blue. Raise your hand when you think it's turning blue. slowly, some a little bit earlier, some a little bit later. And here you can get a good, so where I started was uh, here, oh. <laughs> here, there they came. There is God. But that transition is very slow, and it's a nice little way of trying to get people to understand speciation that it's not that easy, you can't just go from one species to the next. So it's, again, there are a lot of, I knew there were going to be a lot of people who were teaching science education, I wanted to give them maybe a little tool that I used, and I actually used this tool to convince my father. So, it worked. It took me 40 years. <laughs> but I was really happy when I finally did convince him. So now I want to get back to sexual selection and natural selection, and try to understand the difference between the two and, and how they overlap. And I'm going to do it by using humans, because this is what I do. I taught, I used to teach at the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs, which everyone knows is just the bastion of free thought, and yeah, it's a fun place, Teddy Haggard, and focus on the family. And So I had, I had when I first started teaching the class on human sexuality from an evolutionary perspective, I had a few students in class, I didn't have very many, and there was a whole front row of students, um, unfortunately they were all women, um, who sat there with their arms crossed their chest like this, shaking their head the entire time. And they and their parents went to the dean and said, why is she talking about evolution? What does that have to do with sex? And um, tried to get me to stop teaching the course. Uh, fortunately, the dean did side with me since, of course, everything to do with sex has to do with evolution. And the course ended up growing into a much larger course, 150 students, and it was multidisciplined by the time I finished teaching there. So I was very, very happy. And it was a way of getting students who really had no concept of evolutionary theory to learn about evolutionary theory while getting tips on how to date. So it was appreciated. So I, you know, it was like, how do I get the students' interest? Because my only real goal in teaching that class was to teach about evolution. That was my goal, and it was the platform I used. So, natural selection, just in generalities, again, there's always going to be some overlap. We're going to talk about in terms of the heart, lungs, bones, bladder, the skeleton, that shape by natural selection, you know, opposable thumbs, all that. So I'm not going to get into that. I think most of you understand and um, get, that, get that idea. Sexual selection, on the other hand, um, gets a little more complicated. We're, we're talking about human behavior, and we're also talking about physical characteristics. So I'm first going to talk about some of the physical characteristics, and this is in, in line with a lot, lot of the research that I did. So, one, we have what's called, how many have heard of hip to waist ratio? It's pretty common, common now. And body mass index, of course, anybody watching your way immediately wants to know what their BMI is, and it gets into, so we use it for a lot of different different reasons. But hip to waist ratio, when it comes to um, humans, um, have that ratio has a signal of who, of females, whether or not they can conceive, whether or not they're fertile and can carry a healthy infant to term. Now, this is why men like curves. It has nothing to do with the media. It has nothing to do with Madison Avenue. This has to do with simple evolutionary processes. When women are underweight, they cannot conceive. 
they do not have enough body fat. When children are prepubescent, they're very, very thin. They're, I mean, they don't have shape. Boys and girls kind of look the same in terms of body shape. But as we sexually mature, and much to, I mean, when I was young, I, you know, gaining weight was just horrible. Everybody wanted to be twiggy. I had no idea that curves were good. I, that was by Madison Avenue. You, you know, you are supposed to be just skin and bones. And, but the curves is, are simply a signal that, that, you can, that a woman can conceive. That body fat that we have on our bodies, especially on the buttocks, is what feeds the fetal brain. It's a really interesting study that, that was done. Women as, who have children, they lose the fat on the curvature back of their buttocks. It becomes flatter, and I'm not going to ask women to make note of that um, publicly, but those of you who are older and have had children will probably notice that the, the curvature of your buttocks has flattened. Well, that's good for your children because that means they have really good healthy brains. That fat is, is, is critically important to development of the fetal brain. So let's look at curvature. Now, yes, culture and societies have kind of changed, you know, thin and fit. I mean, now being fit is really important. But has it really changed the ratio? I mean, Marilyn Monroe would probably be considered a little bit overweight by our standards um, in terms of modeling. But she definitely has the curves, and I think most women with a body like that would be perfectly happy. And I think I don't think there's very many males in this room who would find that unattractive. Here's more modern, but again, she's much thinner, but again, she has the tiny waist. To, in comparison to her hips. Her waist is much smaller than her hips. And then here's another one. I mean, you know, and there, the cinching, and this is where we start getting into style. We always hear about how Western cultures are the ones who are saying how women should dress and look. Well, actually, no. They react to the evolutionary pressures of what makes a woman attractive to a man. And that cinched right waist is attractive. And because it shows that the hips, and notice I'm not talking about breast size. I'm talking about simply waist to hip. That's important. Again, this is a signal of fertility. And here's another one. So again, we're just talking you know, different thinness effects, but the same body effect. And we can go back. Again, here, again, she's got that hip to waist ratio. So it's been around a long time, and we're not going to change it. Men, yes, we also, women do look at men, and men have a little different ratio, and that is chest to waist ratio. Big chest, height is important, and athletic prowess. Now, we can certainly think about um, athleticism. Um, in terms of our hunter-gatherer past, being healthy and athletic would have been better for bringing in game and being able to survive because there was a lot of violence back then. And if any of you haven't read Steve Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, I highly recommend it. It will be uplifting to realize that we really are a pretty good species compared to where we were in the past. So this ratio that women look like, again, is an indicator. It's an indicator of testosterone levels. It's an indicator of health and youth. And again, this is nothing new. Now these, this is what we call sexual dimorphism. Now we all know about the story of the peacock, right? Peacocks have these wonderful big tails. They're pretty useless except for one thing. They attract peahens. Peahens really dig peacock tails. <laughs> and there is a, and this is where natural selection and sexual selection kind of collide. There is a point when the pea tail, the peacock's tail, would become so big that he could no longer run from prey. So natural selection sort of acts as a, a, a stop. 
So the tail is as big and blue and beautiful as nature will allow it so that he can at least survive long enough to attract a few peahens.